Uh, welcome to Saving Life on Earth Online and our very first inaugural deep dive issue webinar. We're really excited to have you here tonight. We're talking about um, saving reptiles, amphibians, and all the creatures that we really love. Before we get started, uh, I'm going to give you a couple tech uh, pointers about Zoom. Again, my name is Ash. I'm the engagement manager with the Center for Biological Diversity. Um, just navigating your Zoom space, know that we have taken out the chat feature. A lot of people reached out to us saying that it was really distracting. Uh, it also protects you against trolls. You can definitely still ask questions by hovering your mouse over your screen and finding the question and answer bottom at the bottom. Um, once you push it, you can answer excuse me, ask a question of one of us, and we'll get to those in our Q&A session at the end. I'd also like to run over our community guidelines for tonight. Uh, as you can see on the screen, please remember that we are going to follow these principles on the call tonight to ensure a respectful and inclusive space uh, to summarize these for our friends on the phone, we ask that you be respectful in your interactions with others, be inclusive, and follow the Himmez principles and agree to nonviolence. Okay, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to our host, Aunt Tiara, and uh, to let us kick us off for the evening. Tiara? Hey, everybody. Welcome to the weekly Saving Life on Earth webinar series, and thank you so much for joining us. I'm Tiara Curry. I am a socially awkward and technologically challenged senior scientist at the center, so this is going to be fun for both of us with me hosting this instead of Ash. Um, during the coronavirus pandemic, there's been a lot of finger pointing in other countries and a lot of talk about international wildlife trade without looking at the role the United States plays in wildlife trade. We're actually responsible for about 20% of the total global market, and we import and export millions of wild animals every year. And amphibians and reptiles are a big part of that, and as a group, they're highly imperiled. So that's why we're going to focus on them tonight. And I'm really excited about this conversation because I love frogs so much. They were my first love. I grew up in Kentucky beside a cane swamp full of spring peepers. And Spring peepers were like the soundtrack of my childhood and there was a little creek and I remember the first time I saw a polywog, I went flying home to tell my mom that I found a dinosaur alien because I had no idea what it was and I just thought it was so cool. And frogs sing and they come in so many shapes and sizes and colors and their eyeballs, I don't know if you ever looked in a frog's eyes, but I just think that their eyes look like the universe. So I'm really passionate about them. Above them, I think it's so unfair that they're in so much trouble because they were here first. And just in the last couple of decades, humans have made the planet pretty unlivable for amphibians and reptiles. So it's awesome that the center has two full-time herpetofauna attorneys. Herp is from the Greek word to creep or to crawl. And um, so the study of amphibians and reptiles is called herpetology. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jenny and Elise, the world's coolest and perhaps only herpetofauna attorneys to introduce themselves. Hi everybody, thanks for joining us. I'm Jenny Loda. I'm one of the Center's Amphibian and Reptile Staff Attorneys, or Herpetofauna Attorney. I'm based out of our Oakland, California office. Hi everyone, I'm Elise Bennett, and I'm the other Reptile and Amphibian Staff Attorney, and I'm based out of Florida in the Tampa Bay area. So Elise and I both work to stem the Amphibian and Reptile Extinction Crisis. Unfortunately, amphibians and reptiles are among the species most at risk. More than 40% of the world's amphibians and about 20% of the world's reptiles are at risk of dying now. <clears throat> the situation is particularly dire for turtles and frogs. About 61% of the world's turtles are threatened or already extinct. 3% of frogs worldwide are already extinct, and if we don't change things up, another 7% will likely be lost in the next century. Amphibians and reptiles face a wide range of threats, including habitat destruction, disease, overcollection, toxins, climate change, and non-native predators. Unfortunately, many species are dealing with multiple threats all at once. So today, we're going to talk a little bit about the role trade plays in amphibian and reptile plants and our work to tackle issues. Hey, Jenny, uh, I'm noticing that your audio is going in and out, um, and it's actually becoming kind of garbled. 
I'm wondering um, if you are able to just maybe like take a peek at that um, and uh, let us know if you're able to, to fix that. Um, well, let us know, and maybe Tira, you want to take us um, on to uh, onto the next question, perhaps? Yeah. yeah. Um, Thanks. Maybe, Jenny, maybe you have headphones or something. I don't know if that would help. That helps me sometimes. So, Elise, hopefully your audio is working, and can you talk to us about the big picture issue and how wildlife trade affects reptile populations here in the United States? Hi, hopefully you can hear me a little better here. Yes, I'd love to talk more about that. As you mentioned, Tierra, lately the focus has been on the trade and consumption of wildlife in other countries like China. But we also have a thriving wildlife trade right here in the United States, which is why we wanted to take a little bit of time this evening to talk to you about the dramatic trade of reptiles and amphibians. Unfortunately, we help drive these wildlife markets by importing these animals and by trapping and trading our own native species. And this trade has serious consequences for wildlife populations. For example, the U.S. exports more than a million live native turtles each year, many of them from the wild, to be sold for meat, as pets, and for use in traditional medicine. And these turtles are also sold in live markets right here in the United States. And turtle is used in some regional dishes like turtle soup and can even be found on restaurant menus in some locales. And national trends indicate that these prices and a demand for our turtles is going to continue to rise. So to meet this massive demand for turtles, commercial trappers go out into rivers, streams, lakes, and swamps all around the country and set traps that can capture turtles by the dozen. And then there's the darker side of the trade, poachers, who purposely seek out rare and imperiled species to sell at a premium to collectors who seek out those turtles for their rarity. Uh, as you can see on the slide there, that's one of the larger turtle species that's used for, um, for sale for meat, and then box turtles, which are often targeted for the pet trade. So this demand-driven exploitation has really irreversible effects on wild turtle populations. For turtles to persist, an adult has to be able to live a long life and produce many eggs, a very, very few of which will actually hatch and survive to adulthood to start the process all over again. Turtle eggs and hatchlings are really vulnerable to predators like raccoons and eagles and owls, and one study of common snapping turtles showed that um, the likelihood of a turtle hatching and then living to the age of one was only 22%. So that's a really small chance of survival. Once they're bigger and sexually mature, turtles have a much better protection against natural predators just because of their shell and their size. And at that point, it's critical that they stay in the wild where they can help build the next generation. But they can't do that if we're out there trapping and selling them. And unfortunately, it's these adult turtles that are most vulnerable to trapping and trade. And this is why experts have concluded that commercial trapping is just not sustainable for turtles. Even moderate levels of harvest can cause populations to decline or even disappear. And aside from being incredibly fun to see in the wild, from the adorable little map turtles to the prehistoric looking snappers, turtles also play a really important role in maintaining the health of their aquatic environments. And without them, whole ecosystems can suffer. So you can see how our booming domestic trade can have serious consequences for nating, native turtles and ecosystems. Wow, that's so many turtles that we trap. Ginny, is the big, in the big picture, is the situation the same for amphibians? So the situation is a little bit different when it comes to the amphibian trade. While trade in amphibians does impact the populations the animals are taken from in the wild, the biggest issue is caused by the amphibian trade worldwide has been the spread of disease. In particular, the amphibian chytrid fungus is considered to be the most destructive um, pathogen described by science. It has contributed to declines of hundreds of species worldwide, as well as a number of extinctions. The chytrid fungus was likely able to spread around the world primarily through the trade in bullfrogs and African clawed frogs. 
The clot frogs were historically used around the world for pregnancy tests and are also commonly used in lab studies. Bullfrogs are used for food, pets, and lab studies. They can be found both in live animal markets as well as in restaurants sold as frog legs. A study published a couple of years ago by Tiffany Yap, who's a senior, center here, senior scientist here at the center, showed a strong historical link between the introduction of the American bullfrog into the Western US and the emergence of the deadly chytrid fungus. Here in California, bullfrogs were originally introduced during the gold rush and were farmed for frog legs, but escaped when the gold rush crashed and the farms were abandoned. The spread of disease in California has contributed to the declines of many of our amphibian species and is the primary factor in the sharp declines of the endangered mountain yellow-legged frogs, which are found in the Sierra Nevadas. Unfortunately, California continues to allow the importation of live bullfrogs into the state, most of which are sold in live animal markets like the one seen in the photo. So disease is on everyone's mind right now and the spread of disease seems especially relevant for humans and for wildlife and we're all quarantined in our houses, but how do we stop the spread of disease in wildlife populations? Right, so given how threatened our amphibians and reptiles are, anything we can do to reduce or eliminate any of these threats is going to help stem declines and extinction. So we tackle many different issues in our work. As COVID-19 is so clearly reminding us, wildlife trade can play a major role in facilitating the spread of disease, both among wildlife and between wildlife and people. And watching the spread of COVID-19 around the globe and seeing how difficult it is to stop such a disease once it's arrived, it's another good reminder about why we need to be really proactive about tackling these issues as early as possible. So while we unfortunately did not understand what was happening with the amphibian chytrid fungus until it was too late to stop most of its spread around the globe, there's still a lot of work that we can do to prevent this from happening again with other emerging wildlife diseases. So to save amphibians from extinction and humans from future pandemics, we have to strengthen policies on wildlife trade. But I'm human, I can't get chytrid fungus, so is exploitation of amphibians and reptiles relevant to human health at all, Elise? It is. Our trade in reptiles and amphibians risks hurting people by putting them in close contact with animals that can carry other diseases or contaminants that are harmful to our health. For instance, at rattlesnake roundups, which are these cruel and outdated snake hunting events, people snatch rattlesnakes from their burrows and pile them into these enclosures where they are then handled and sometimes they're butchered right out in the open. One of the most notorious events has even encouraged children to skin snakes with their bare hands and leave bloody handprints on a nearby wall. Not only are these practices incredibly cruel, but they put people into close contact with wild snakes that are stressed and can harbor disease. And that disease they can pass on through bites and other means to humans. Even more attenuated interactions with wildlife like eating wild caught turtles is risky. Many of the larger, longer-lived turtle species sold for their meat can bioaccumulate contaminants, including pesticides and heavy metals like mercury. And unfortunately, many of the waters where turtles live are impaired with unsafe levels of contaminants. And then finally, turtles can carry salmonella and other bacteria that's dangerous to humans, even when they look healthy and clean. Uh, so when you handle them, it's, it can be a risk as well. So there really are a lot of risks to humans too when we get up close and personal with wildlife. So it sounds like amphibians and reptiles face so many threats. Jenny, with all the threats they face, how significant is exploitation? So along with habitat loss, domestic trade in wildlife is driving our extinction crisis for many species. For animals like turtles, wild collection is one of the most significant drivers for extinction. Taking just a few adults can have really cascading effects for generations to come. For amphibians, the spread of disease through trade has clearly had direct impacts. And the resulting declines in loss of species has actually also led to impacts on other wildlife, such as those that prey on amphibians. For example, a recent study from Panama showed that the overall number, diversity, and health of snakes that prey on frogs sharply declined after the chytrid fungus swept through one of its national parks. And unfortunately, there are other emerging pathogens that threaten amphibians. For instance, in 2013, a different type of chytrid fungus, one that primarily affects salamanders, was discovered to be the cause of massive die-offs of fire salamanders in Northern Europe. What we now refer to as the salamander chytrid fungus 
uh, appears to have originated in Asia where it's been around for centuries and, and the frogs are not, or the salamanders are not impacted by it. But it's been, uh, seems to have been introduced into Europe through the pet trade. This is all very overwhelming. So at least, how do we fix this? Well, we have to stop exploiting our own wildlife for profit. And the best way to make sure that doesn't happen anymore is to adopt laws that ban the unsustainable trapping and trade of wildlife. Luckily, the center's been working on that and we're trying to end the trade of reptiles and amphibians at all levels from international all the way down to state and local. For example, we have an ongoing campaign to persuade every state to ban commercial trapping of wild turtles because that's just low hanging fruit. We know it's not sustainable. So over the past decade, we've petitioned or advocated to ban trapping in 15 states, and eight states have banned the practice or adopted stronger protections at the very least. So we're now focusing on 10 holdout states that still allow trapping of at least one native turtle species in unlimited numbers. And this includes big players in the turtle game like Louisiana, Oklahoma, and South Carolina to get them to permanently end wild turtle trapping. But there's some good news on the horizon. Uh, a South Carolina bill banning the trade of native reptiles and amphibians, including turtles, has passed in the House and it's moving through the Senate right now. And also the legislature in Minnesota is considering a bill to end commercial turtle harvest. So if you're from one of those states, these are perfect opportunities to speak out and to help put an end to the trade in wild turtles. Each of us can also play a part of the solution by refusing to purchase wild animals or products made from wild animals. As long as there's a demand for these wild species, there will be people willing to go out and snatch them from their habitat for profit. Wow, it's amazing that you've already changed the practices in eight states. Ginny, what else is the center doing to address wildlife trade here in the US? So we're also working to tackle the amphibian trade and the spread of disease in a few different ways. Here in California, as I mentioned earlier, we continue to have the issue of live bullfrogs being imported, primarily for sale in live animal markets, despite evidence that these bullfrogs continue to get out into the wild and often are infected with the chytrid fungus. So even though the, this chytrid is already present in much of California, we know from recent research that there are actually different strains of disease that have not yet arrived here, and so they could pose a really major threat to our native species. So um, to deal with this issue, we petitioned the California Fish and Game Commission to ban the importation of live bullfrogs. And we've been advocating around this campaign for several years. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a new disease threat on the horizon in the form of the salamander chytrid fungus. Fortunately, when it was first discovered, it was restricted to you know, its native range in Asia and only a few countries in Europe where it has led to some massive declines of species. Um, and as I mentioned, it was likely to have spread there through the pet trade. We were really concerned about the potential for this disease to spread into the U.S., especially when we found out that we've been, we had been importing 2 million salamanders for the pet trade over a 10-year period. And the vast majority of those were actually salamanders that we knew could carry the disease. So in the U.S. actually has the the highest diversity of salamanders in the world. We have about 25% of salamander species here in the U.S. And many of which uh, studies found that would be susceptible, susceptible to this fungus. So back in 2015, we actually petitioned the Fish and Wildlife Service to, to ban the importation of all salamanders. And the following year, the agency did put a halt on importation, but only for 201 species of salamanders into the U.S. So far, this does seem to be really helping to keep the disease from getting to our shores as it's still not been detected, even though there have been a lot of surveys done. Uh, unfortunately, since the ban was instituted, we've learned there are a number of other salamander species and some frogs that can actually serve as carriers for this disease. So we have plans to file another petition asking the service to expand its export importation ban to cover all of these species. So we're also concerned with the um, salamander trade that's actually happening just right here within the United States. Salamanders are actually frequently collected from the wild and moved around for use as fishing bait um, all over between different states. And so this serves as another means for disease to spread in addition to potentially impacting local populations 
as well as just the sheer cruelty of fishing with a live salamander. So we started compiling information about the different states' regulations around the collection and use of salamander bait and planned to have a similar campaign around this issue to the one that Elise has discussed for turtle trapping. So what can people who aren't amphibian and reptile attorneys do to help? Elise? Well, on the very basic level, I know I'm singing to the choir here, but don't support these trades. Uh, you can refuse to purchase wild animals or products made from them. Many of these animals take a lot of knowledge and care to be in captivity, so they don't always make great pets. Uh, but if you do decide to have a pet, please consider adopting one in need of a home rather than purchasing from a commercial dealer. And above all, be sure that the animal wasn't taken from the wild. Ask those questions. Um, and if you decide you can't care for it, please don't let it go into the wild. <laughs> but um, on another note, and on a broader note, if you're feeling particularly ambitious, you could start a letter writing campaign against events that exploit wild animals, like rattlesnake roundups, or petition your wildlife agencies to adopt rules to protect them like we have. Um, and if you want to do something quick and easy with the biggest bang for your buck, you can support the center's efforts through our action alerts. In fact, We'd like to ask you to join us right now in taking action to stop rattlesnake roundups tonight. These roundups are really cruel and they harm snakes in their ecosystems and could really easily be changed to wildlife friendly educational events instead. So the center, we've actually been trying to stop rattlesnake roundups for the last 10 years. And three of the ones that we worked on a really long time ago, two in Georgia and one in Alabama, stopped being roundups and became wildlife friendly events. So we think that if we can put enough pressure on the organizers of the remaining roundups, we can change them. So we want to know, are you ready to take action to help us save amphibians and reptiles? So we're gonna launch a poll right now. And the question is, will you commit to joining us and taking action to end rattlesnake roundups? The, the people go out in the wild and collect the rattlesnakes and they like store them up to take them to these events because there's prizes for the biggest snake and the most snakes. And a lot of times they collect them by pouring gas or ammonia or something toxic into tortoise burrows or other places that are habitat for other species. So like 350 different species can be harmed when people are out gathering snakes for the roundups. And Honestly, it's hard to get people to care about snakes. Everybody wants to save mammals and butterflies and getting people to take action for snakes is harder. So that's why we want you to commit to taking action, sign our petition to end rattlesnake roundups. Let's see here. How many people are going to commit to taking action? Are we ready to close the poll? What do you think, Sarah? Yeah, let's close the poll. All right, going once, going twice. Here we go. Thank you, Ash. So, 244 people said yes, they're taking action to help us end rattlesnake roundup. So thank you so much. Seeing your commitment makes me feel even more motivated and committed to work on this issue. And um, Elise and Jenny, these issues can be pretty tough. What keeps you motivated to work on them? Elise. Well, first, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we deal with a lot of really heavy things working, but the thing that I always come back to is how amazing our planet is and all of these creatures we see. I was just reading about some lizards in Florida today that swim under the sand, and the only way to tell whether they're living in an area is to put a board over the sand and to see the little wiggle marks they've left. And I just think that's such an incredible little detail about a lizard I wouldn't have even known about if not for these scientists that are out in the field studying them. And to know that there's so many other unique species out there is just mind blowing to me. And I wanna do everything I can to protect them. And so, you know, sometimes having to deal with some of these sadder issues is worth it to get to see these amazing creatures and read about them every day. So I've, also, I've been fascinated by animals as long as I can remember. And as a kid, it was really the smaller critters like the earthworms and the frogs that were the most accessible to me. Uh, I grew up on a, a hobby farm and we had a pond with lots of uh, tree frogs here. And so I got lots of exposure to those. Um, but yeah, as I got older, I learned a lot more about these unique creatures and all the threats that they face. And I knew I had to work to protect them. 
I've always um, been one to root for the underdog, and amphibians and reptiles are often overlooked in favor of big and fluffy species. So most of these guys have been around for millions of years, long before we got here. So I think we really need to do all that we can to ensure they continue to survive. I'm actually jealous of both of your work because you get to work on so many cool creatures. So I'm wondering if you have a favorite species. Well, my favorite species tends to change from day to day, but being in social isolation at home, I've gotten really up close and personal with my backyard fauna. And so I've kind of fallen back in love with the Eastern Black Racer, which is just this really long, skinny, uh, very common snake with a white throat and chin. And they're found all over the state of Florida and they're super speedy, which is why they're called racers. Um, and I call the ones in my backyard up periscopes because you can always catch them spying on you in the backyard. <laughs> and um, I don't know if you can tell, but in the picture of my dog scandal there, you can actually see a snake photobombing there in the background. And so, uh, so I've been enjoying some of my more common backyard species right now. What about you, Jenny? So like Elise, I've, I've always been fascinated by many different species and I, I have a hard time picking favorites because they're all really cool and unique in their own way. Uh, but one I've been fascinated with for a long time is the California tiger salamander. If you look closely at the picture, you can see they seem to always have this perpetual smile on their face. And besides that they're just totally adorable, California tiger salamanders have really fascinating life histories. Um, they spend most of their lives in underground burrows made by other animals like squirrels or gophers. And then they only come out to visit wetlands and breed when there's been enough rain. Uh, but here in California, we have a lot of droughts. And so they, they know when's the right time to come out and breed. Sometimes that doesn't happen for years. And then when they do move between their terrestrial and wetland sites, they can actually travel almost two miles to find the right spot, which is pretty amazing for these little guys. That's amazing. Two miles on those little legs. So that's the end of our formal presentation. And now we're going to go to questions and answers. So you guys can type in questions and we will be able to see them and answer them. Um, let's see. I think this is one for Elise. Why is there so much turtle trapping in the United States? Well, it's likely a number of factors. First of all, we have an incredible species richness of turtles here in the United States, particularly in the Southeast, which just means we have an incredible range of types of turtles that people are interested in. When you pair that with the fact that we still have several states that allow really uninhibited trapping of turtles and the fact that there's this really high demand, um, over a million turtles each year that are exported out of the United States, uh, you know, it really all comes together to create a bad scene for turtles. And so our hope is that as we can try to close up some of these loopholes in this tapestry of state laws we have to protect turtles, uh, we'll actually start to see less trapping here in the United States. And that would really give our turtles a break uh, while they also fight against all of those other threats Jenny talked about, like habitat loss and climate change and all of these other really overwhelming threats. Thanks, Elise. So here we have a question about frogs. I guess this one's going to be for Jenny. Do people still dissect frogs in classrooms and where do the frogs come from? So yeah, unfortunately there are still um, frog dissections happening um, in some places. Um, and many of these frogs are actually just taken out directly from wild populations. Um, usually, you know, by, by commercial collectors that sell into these biological supply houses. I actually heard once that from a, I think it was a colleague here at the center that um, their school where their kids went actually told them to go out and collect frogs themselves. Uh, so that was a little, <laughs> that seemed a little crazy to me. Um, but yeah, so it's a real problem that, you know, sometimes these wetlands are likely being decimated to be collecting these, these frogs. Um, and, you know, there are really, that's really not necessary. There are actually really great alternatives, um, including there's their virtual options. Um, I, I think there, there are probably several, but one that I've heard that's, that seems to be good is called Digital Frog. Um, and they're, they're also like, just like mo frog models or even, um, even more fancy like synthetic frogs to try to really imitate the real thing. Um, and so I think this is a really good area that people, if people want to take action locally, they can, 
um, you know, find out, you know, check with your kid's teacher or school or just your neighborhood school district and see, are they still doing this and see if you can work to help them offer alternatives and um, to make this happen. Thanks, Jenny. And then this question is going to be for Elise. How common are rattlesnake roundups? Well, based on some information that we gathered with our friends at Advocates for Snake Preservation, we think that there's just over a dozen of these left, mainly in Texas and in Oklahoma and perhaps a few in the southeast as well. But fortunately, as you mentioned earlier, these numbers are dwindling. Thanks to pressure from conservation and animal welfare groups and individuals like you all here who care about this issue, a lot of these events have changed from rattlesnake roundup to wildlife, you know, wildlife educational event. And our hope is that if we all just continue voicing what we want, which is people to be nice to rattlesnakes and to teach us about them, that the rest of these events will eventually become something wildlife friendly and happy that we can all enjoy going to. That would be so great. <laughs> um, let's see. This one looks like a question for Jenny. Are vehicle strikes a serious threat for amphibians and reptiles? And could these animals use overpasses or underpasses? Yeah, vehicle strikes can be a really big problem for some amphibians and reptiles. Um, when you think about like the California tiger salamander I mentioned, they're often not living most of the year right next to the wetland where they need to go to breed. And so sometimes there are roads in between. And so that can be a big issue, is, um, you know, especially in certain areas where there might be a whole bunch of uh, salamanders trying to cross in the same place. And I know there's some areas like here in Berkeley where they actually close the roads in one of the local parks uh, for, for much of the winter because there are uh, newts that are crossing the roads. Um, and, that, and there are places throughout the country where there are local citizens that actually help move the, the salamanders across the roads and try to warn vehicles. Um, but yeah, obviously that's not a great, um, that's not always the easiest strategy. So um, there is more of a movement to, to putting underpasses in roads to allow this movement. And, and that does seem to be working in some places. And same for, for, for reptiles, they're um, slightly different issue. You, you know, often the reptiles are looking for a place to kind of warm up. And so rattlesnakes, other snakes, and um, you know, sometimes lizards are out on the on the asphalt at night trying to keep warm because that's usually the, a nice warm spot. And so they often uh, suffer from uh, vehicle strikes as well. And, and I know turtles have the same issue as with the um, amphibians that I mentioned. They're often moving um, between, you know, wetlands and to find an upland breeding habitat. So they kind of go in the opposite direction as the, <laughs> the amphibians for breeding. Um, but so yeah, they have the same issues. I think either one of you can answer this question. It's kind of two related questions. What federal agency is responsible to police poaching and trading of turtles and frogs? And is there any chance of getting a national law related to turtle exports or amphibian imports? I, I can uh, start by taking a stab at it, and Jenny, feel free to, to come in. Um, you know, there's, there's obviously the federal agencies. There's the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which protects all of our, our um, you know, terrestrial and aquatic species. And then every state has a wildlife agency as well, and, and all of these agencies work together to try to catch these people and, and who are doing the poaching. Um, in addition, what was that other question again? Could there be a federal law? Uh, that is something that we're looking into. We have in the past been looking at states because states are often, they're at the ground level, they know what's going on in each state and they're able, they have the power to regulate how wildlife is used in the state. And um, it's a, a public trust duty and power that they have. Um, but certainly it's something that we're looking into. It would be much easier, wouldn't it? Yeah, I'll just add a little bit to that. Um, in terms of the, the salamanders where we where I said we, we got an import ban, um, it was sort of a unique strategy in how we, we got that. So the, um, the Fish and Wildlife Service has control over a law called the Lacey Act. And one of the provisions of that act um, allows them to prevent the importation of species that are considered to be 
damaging to either our natural resources or agriculture. Um, and generally there are things that you think of as like non-native and invasive species, you know, that if they get out, you know, could cause some pests that may cause major problems for agriculture or, or some other type of um, non-native species that might get in the wild and really cause havoc. So um, we actually petitioned them under the Lacey Act to add the salamanders based on the fact that they could be carrying this disease and that disease itself um, could be causing that problem. And so that's how we were able to get the 201 species uh, listed. But in terms of getting, you know, potentially getting a new law, that's, you know, something that would be great if we could uh, move that, you know, something like that forward um, to ban the importation, except maybe, you know, obviously for some exceptions for scientific research and things like that. Um, and then we've also used uh, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, or CITES, the international treaty to um, push forward some protections for the turtles. Uh, so far, basically, they've gotten on the one level, the lowest level of the list was just simply that we have, they, um, the importers, exporters have to keep be tracking uh, what, which turtles are moving and where. Um, and then, you know, we have pushed for a higher level of protections beyond that. And we'll, we'll continue working on that as well. That's actually one of the questions. How does CITES apply to these species? I don't know if there's anything more you want to say about that or if you already answered it. Here's a nice philosophical question. How do you begin to work with or change the minds of people who are absolutely not interested in stopping these traditions? I'll take a stab. I don't know that I have an answer, but I, you know, I think what we're just trying to do is to, to keep talking about these issues with people and, and maybe we find commonality and we're able to, um, you know, make them agree with us, but maybe we don't. But I think what's very important is that we keep bringing up these issues and talking about them. And that's why, you know, I mean, I think a great example is with these Rattlesnake Roundup events, it took sometimes many years of sending letters and talking with organizers, with the public sending letters and making phone calls to finally, uh, you know, come up with an agreeable solution, which, you know, for a lot of these events, the most important thing was the community coming together and, uh, you know, having a lot of fun together and perhaps raising money for some kind of local charity and, uh, you know, eventually what we were able to figure out was that didn't need to be done by exploiting rattlesnakes. That could be done by having an educational show or something else. So uh, examples like that give me hope that maybe if the, con the conversation continues that there might be some way to find an answer that, that works. Um, but changing hearts and minds, I don't know what the answer to that is other than to keep trying. Persistence. Um. Are there, someone asked, are there initiatives for us to support amphibian and reptile habitat preservation where we live? So how can people get involved locally to help amphibians and reptiles? I, I hate to be a, a microphone hog here, uh, <laughs> but you know, I, I, I guess it depends on where you live. I know where I live in St. Petersburg, Florida, we actually have a biologist, George Heinrich, who does, um, tortoise burrow surveys for gopher tortoises here and he needs volunteers to come out and help him find out where these tortoises burrows are and try to estimate how many tortoises are there and what kind of management needs to be done for the habitat and um, he said time and time again he could never do that research without volunteers being out there helping so i mean that's just one example here but i think all over the all over the country there are opportunities to go out and be a part of citizen science um, you know, that might be listening for frog calls. I know Jenny knows a lot about that. Um, it could be going out and doing a cleanup to make the habitat safer for the wildlife. I think there's tons of little ways you can get involved in your local community to make life better for these animals. Yeah, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just echo that. I think, you know, there, there is a lot that can be done. And um, in terms of habitat preservation, um, I think, you know, one thing is that there's often already a lot of habitat, you know, preserved in parks, but it may not be ideal habitat. And, and there are a lot of groups are working on habitat restoration that can improve those habitats. And one thing you can do is just, if you have a, you know, big backyard, just think of, look into, you know, what you can do to support 
um, amphibians and reptiles living there. Um, but also, yeah, just look into your local parks and, um, you know, federal lands, parks, and see what's going on there. And if you can help with research or habitat restoration, any, any little bit you can contribute would really helps. Here's a question about individuals and chytrid fungus. Is there anything individuals can do in their local e ecosystem to mitigate or stop the spread of chytrid fungus? I can, Jenny, do you want to take that one? If not, I'll take it. <laughs> I, yeah, I think be. I mean, there there are um, in, you know methods to if you're moving around, if you're traveling around between a lot of different areas, and you're concerned, you might be concerned about spreading the chytrid fungus like on your boots. Um, you know, there there are methods to decontaminate um, those uh, because it can really, as long as there's any sort of moisture on your shoes, it potentially could survive there, um, and. So that's one way, um, if, if you have a pet amphibian, the most important thing is don't release it into the wild. And then also don't dump out, if you're cleaning the tank, don't clean it outside, don't dump the water outside because that could be contaminated. And also, the, and so I don't have the, the, the message handy, but um, there, are, there are places where you can report um, dead, dead uh, salamanders or frogs if you see them. And, and in particular, scientists are really looking for reports of dead salamanders to try to see if they can detect um, where the salamander chytrid fungus might be showing up. Thanks, Jenny. Here's another policy question. What is being done to classify some of these species as endangered? Sorry, I, I minimized and I couldn't reach my button. <laughs> um, well, the center has been working really hard to get many species listed under the Endangered Species Act that need those protections. And in fact, we filed a petition to list 53 reptiles and amphibians under the Endangered Species Act because of threats ranging from habitat loss and climate change to collection for the pet trade, to pollution, to disease, like with some of those salamanders. And so, we're continuing to work to get those protections for these species that are in most need. And, and right now what that's been doing, um, what that has required has been litigating to get these decisions made for these species. And then once these species are actually listed, helping to get the information together to get them recovery plans and to get them protected critical habitat. Um, you know, we're trying to see these species through from the beginning into the end and making sure that they're getting the protections all along the way. Can individuals help with that? Absolutely. Uh, every time a species is um, up for consideration for Endangered Species Act protections, you can submit public comments and support. You can submit studies and explain why you think this species needs protection, and that's really helpful. Um, you can also support the center and all the efforts that we're making to get these species listed. And another thing that's useful, especially for folks that might be scientists or citizen scientists and be out in the field and, and see what's happening with some of these species is to just alert us if, if there's some you know, species you're particularly concerned about that we may not be working on. That's actually often how we you know, just decide to work on certain um, campaigns is based on hearing what folks are seeing in the field. Here's a specific question about turtle trapping. Is there a list of which states adequately protect turtles and which states do not? There is actually. Um, we recently published a report that uh, gives a survey of all the different state laws and which states allow the trapping of at least one native species in unlimited numbers. That is our gauge to determine whether a, a state's laws are, are really bad for turtle trapping. And so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's there's 10 states left that we're really focusing on. Uh, across the rest of the country, there either is no turtle trapping or there are protections put in place that we're hopeful will continue to be strengthened over the years. And so, um, you know, that's, a, that's probably the most up-to-date comprehensive resource that we have right now because it's something we've been keeping track of. Here's kind of an ecology question. Does the loss of amphibians and reptiles affect keystone apex reptiles like alligators? 
this is my moment to plug freshwater mussels. So <laughs> I love freshwater mussels and they are really sensitive to water pollution. And as a lot of those species declined, a lot of turtle species declined. And then as steps were taken to improve the habitat for the freshwater mussels, the turtles bounced back because it was their food source. And so everything, everything is connected from the turtle. Did you, either one of you guys want to tackle the alligator question directly? At least Miss Florida. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not aware of any studies that talk about this, but, but as Tira mentioned, you know, everything is just so interconnected in the food web. I, it wouldn't be surprising to me if protecting these turtles would also have a beneficial impact on, on alligators, but I can't speak to any specific information. Here's a human health question. How can we help humans to relate to tie their health into protecting reptiles and amphibians? Jenny, you want to take that one? Sure. I think it just it's really just through education and, and making, you know, especially around, um, right now with COVID-19 being so much in the news and there has been a more highlight on the fact that, you know, as we impact the environment, um, it really does cause these, you know, backlashes on us of, of making us have more exposure to these types of diseases. So even if not necessarily directly something from an amphibian or reptile, the the more we really mess with their, these habitats, the more likely we can get exposed to these issues. Um, so I think, yeah, just really, a lot of people just really aren't aware um, of these problems. And so I think just education is a really important first step. And just to tag on to the end of that, is something I often point out with amphibians is they're so dependent on clean, fresh water in their natural habitats. And so if you have an amphibian, uh, for example, a salamander that lives in a spring, and that salamander isn't doing well because the spring is becoming degraded, that's a warning sign to us humans that our water is in trouble. And so maybe you don't care specifically about that salamander, although I don't know why you wouldn't, but even if you didn't, um, you should at least pay attention to that warning sign and you should care what's happening to that salamander because it's telling you a lot about the world around you and the safety of your own water sources. Here's a question about the snake trade. What drives the demand in the snake trade? I can, I'll, I can give you maybe a general answer to that. That's not something I've researched super deeply, but in my experience looking at the snake trade, it seems like the large portion of it is, is for the pet trade. Um, people do eat rattlesnakes at these rattlesnake roundups, um, but I'm not aware, at least here in the United States, uh, about a big market for snake meat. Um, so so I've, my educated guess would be that the majority is for the pet trade. And here's a question about commercial turtle farming. What role does that play in all of this? I can jump on that one again. Um, okay. Yeah, it's turtle farming is a complicated issue and one that we've been looking into as we've been working on our, our state by state work to try to close the commercial harvest. Uh, ideally, the idea would be that you would have this farm and you could farm the turtles and then leave the wild turtles alone and meet the demand and everything's fixed, you know, all, all done. But um, what we're finding right now is that there's not a very firm oversight of what's going on at these turtle farms. And so one of the biggest issues that we're dealing with right now is where are these turtles that they're using to breed turtles coming from? Are they coming from the wild? And if you're taking those adults out of the wild for the farm, um, you know, what impact is that having? That's still having an impact on the natural environment. And then I think the other issue that we've seen, there's been at least one study that I've seen has talked just about whether these farms would be able to really help with keeping wild turtles safe and you know maybe shifting away from wild capture but what they found is that right now um, you know breeders are really only breeding pet species and so there's still trappers going out to get the larger the common snapping turtles the soft shell turtles um, you know for demand for meat um, so, you know, I think there's definitely a lot of complicated issues going on with turtle farming. Uh, it certainly is part of the bigger picture of the turtle trade, um, but it, it doesn't appear to be a solution, at least at this time, for, for the problem of our larger commercial wild turtle trade. Here's a question from someone named Noah. He says, hi, Jenny. I know disease, Noah's our boss. 
I know disease is a very serious threat to amphibians, but isn't habitat destruction an equal or more serious threat to their survival? Noah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, habitat destruction is a major you know, threat to amphibians and reptiles, as it is to a lot of species around the world. Um, but, and so we do work on those issues as well. Um, but one reason we look at these wildlife trade issues, as I think Elise alluded to before, this, in some cases, this is sort of the low-hanging fruit, you know, maybe harder to stop, you know, um, de some developments from happening, but just being able to simply stop commercial trapping of turtles, you've just saved all of those turtles for years to come and allowed them to continue. And, and obviously then they need the habitat as well. Uh, so we'll work on those, those issues also. So that, that is the thing with amphibians and reptiles. They really do have a, a lot of different threats. So we kind of try to tackle a whole bunch of them and, um, and with, you know, disease issues, um, sometimes that can be sort of combined as well as if the habitat's being destroyed, the, you know, amphibians are moved into a smaller area, they might be more exposed to disease or just more vulnerable to disease because, you know, as their immune systems go down, they're, they're more likely to be susceptible, um, which could be from just, you know, less habitat, less quality habitat or things like pesticides impacting them and um, so that's why we kind of have to work on all of these issues all at once. Yeah, so I think we'll take one more question before we wrap up. How can we help get this message out to the media? Well, I think, um, you know, if you're so inclined, you could write a letter to the editor or an opinion piece and talk about these issues. I've been so surprised in the work that I've done with these turtle trapping petitions to find that I'll be meet someone in the state and I'll start talking to them about the fact that turtles are being trapped uh, and sold for their meat. And people said, I had no idea you could even trap a turtle and sell it in the state. And so I think um, that's a great question because you're highlighting the important part of a lot of these issues, which is educating people and making sure that they know that we have a wildlife trade problem here. So, uh, you know, I would encourage you to to you know, write a piece and submit it to your local paper and, and try to tell people about it. I, you know, talk your friends and family's ears off. I know my friends and families love it. Um, but you know, there's so many different ways to get the word out there. And I think the more we talk about it, the more aware people will be and the more we can do. Jenny, how, how has it been with you calling up reporters and trying to get them to cover salamanders and frogs? Are they like, I've been waiting for your phone call my whole life. <laughs> Well, it's pretty variable. <laughs> Unfortunately, they're not as easy of a sell as maybe a wolf or something like that. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, some reporters can be really fascinated with these critters also. And um, I think if you get the right angle, they could be interested, you know, if there's a, if there's a particular project that's going to impact, you know, say the Shasta salamander that I've worked on, it's going to impact a whole bunch of other species. So they might be more concerned. Um, but you really try to highlight the, the salamander and, and, you know, get them to understand why they're so unique and important. Well, thank you both so much for sharing all this information with us tonight and showing us how we can be involved as we're all, a lot of us are still on lockdown, but the coronavirus pandemic has shown us that the world is really small and really connected and wildlife need our help now more than ever. Um, so we're all still working to end extinction and we're super grateful that you're in this fight with us. Next week, our webinar is going to be on Wednesday. It's the 50th anniversary of Earth Day and we're going to be talking about saving half the Earth for wildlife by 2050. So and the, the role of our public land. So we hope you can join us and take care and we'll see you next week. Thank you.